Hello team and welcome to another ATP Geopolitics video with myself, Jonathan M.S. Pierce. This is Ukraine War news update, first part thereof for the 12th of March 2024. There's an awful lot going on at the moment. Today, there's just information coming in about lots of things, particularly lots of fires. Uh, I have been saying for the last few weeks that we are getting to a point in this war where I think there's going to be a step change or there has been or we're in the process of there being a step change with the scaling up of Ukrainian drones so that they can produce Shahid type drones with decent warhead capabilities, decent range capabilities and they are going to be throwing those into Russia and we're going to see an awful lot more of what we're seeing for example today. And I believe that the long-term prognosis for Ukraine is fairly good, that Ukraine's capabilities and capacities will increase as the war goes on. And I think Russia will be, Russia is operating at industrially about, you know, the best it's going to. Yeah, it might be able to inch some further production capacity out of its to war footing. But I think Ukraine is just kind of getting started in that respect and Europe is getting is ramping up in to that respect. I think the big challenge for Ukraine is the political landscape going forward. Of course, I keep talking about uh, the US and, and Trump and whatnot, but also division that might be, you know, opportunistically um, widened by the Russians in Europe. You know, Portugal's just had a populist right-wing party do well and they uh, a right-wing coalition has unseated the socialists there. How will that affect support for Ukraine going forward? You know, what's going to go on in France? Okay, Macron's there till 2027. Uh, you know, but, but there's Marine Le Pen sniping. You know, other countries, you've got the Balkans. But then you've got the Nordic countries and the Baltics and UK fairly solid on support for for Ukraine. You've got Germany having some funky things going on, but actually Olaf Scholz is looking more and more unpopular, but as a result of him not giving things like Taurus to Ukraine. So there's all this political stuff going on. But but aside from that, just in terms of where both countries are industrially I think Ukraine is just going to get into a better and better position and Russia doesn't have all that much further to go. And that translates into meaningful things happening on a front line. So I think Ukraine's ability to hammer Russia with first person dr view drones is good and only getting better uh, with drone coalitions coming to support Ukraine as well. UK just announcing that 10,000 FPV drones and, and similar will be sent to Ukraine in, a, in as part of the drone coalition. And then these drones and missiles going from Ukraine out into Russia uh, that we have seen a lot of today. So anyway, uh, let's go to where we normally start. Ukrainian general staff fi figures for the Russian losses for the day before all the usual caveats apply. 910 personnel lost yesterday is good uh, for the Ukrainians. Eight tanks, 27 APVs. Uh, or that's going to be infantry fighting vehicles, armor personal uh, carriers uh, and whatnot. Mine resistant ambush protection vehicles. Those kind of military vehicles, 27 taken out yesterday. And that is a good haul for the Ukrainians, about double the average. 23 artillery systems, lower than we have seen, but still uh, a, quite a fair bit above the daily average. And then we have two anti-aircraft warfare systems. That's a good haul for the Ukrainians. 44 vehicles and fuel tanks and five pieces of special equipment. So fairly high numbers. I, you know, the Ukrainians have been incredibly... Um, well, they've been rewarded a lot in the last couple of days with some huge hauls in the vehicles and fuel tanks category of sort of 77, 74. Uh, today, 44. It seems like almost low, but actually that's a huge number of vehicles lost in a single day. So some pretty good stats there for the Russians. Let's see what Andrew Perpetua has on his lost stats from looking at the socials over the last 24 hours. Him and his team has shown that it's been another good day for the Ukrainians. It was sort of parity yesterday. And now we're getting back to a sort of three, uh, maybe four, four to one ratio if you take off the decoy at the bottom uh, so let's have a look at what the ukrainians have lost and see uh, a value comparison we have some comms equipment three boats uh, don't know of the size of those or what boats they are 
Uh, some self-propelled guns, no details. A few tanks, no details there. Obviously, not a lot left of them or too far away. Resolutions uh, too poor to work it out. Uh, and then we've got YPR 765, which is the uh, Dutch upgraded version of the M113 uh, armoured personnel, tracked armoured personnel carrier, uh, fairly old. Uh, and the, a Bradley there, damaged. I don't know how badly damaged that is. It looks, well, uh, the claim is it's minimal damage, which is good news there. Uh, and then some civilian vehicles and whatnot. Uh, a decoy, a Nazam's radar decoy, possibly um, uh, taken out there. So good news that that has attracted attention. Then when we go to the Russian uh, equipment, there's an awful lot of surveillance and comms equipment taken out. Some of these are just small camera units on tripods, but they do do quite a lot of uh, useful reconnaissance work. And so it's really important to take them out. That Palantin, though, is a is an important, uh, it's a relatively new bit of kit that's been taken out by a high mass strike or, or gimmel, guided missile strike. Um, if we come down, we've got the 240mm, so the really big um, self-propelled how it, uh, no, self-propelled mortar there uh, being taken out and an old D-20, T-72 and some other tanks, and then a range of infantry fighting vehicles, BMP-1s and 2s and BTRs and whatnot. And then uh, so some varied eight armor personnel carriers taken out, and then down to um, other bits and pieces, you know, military trucks, URLs, Kamaz, low Bukanka vans, and uh, golf carts, and uh, quad bikes, and quads, and, and whatnot. So, yeah, I, I would say that's um, m more of a loss for the Russians, just the sheer weight of the, that sheer mass of equipment lost it just has a huge value. Uh, to add to the tally. So I think, uh, broadly speaking, a better day for the Ukrainians across the board yesterday. Um, there are some other bits of evidence we can throw into things like uh, personnel losses for the Russians. Are they, are, are, is one justified in believing that it's been fairly difficult over the course of the war for the Russians? Well, Su uh, Suchimimus has done a video on comparing satellite images of military graveyards military cemeteries and you can see there that you know there's some pretty that just that one small field and a little bit down there has been expanded sort of maybe to a multiple of four or so you know this is larger these three fields and some down there so uh, and then he goes and you know looks at lots of different uh cemeteries and says actually you know we are seeing uh quite a lot of expansion to military um military cemeteries and that is showing that you know there are considerable deaths for the Russians now I reported yesterday in a breaking news update that the military blogger 13th had possibly died and lots of rumors going out and that's because it had been I think um, announced on his own channel with pictures of, of his own dead body anyway it turns out that he faked it himself uh, what I can work out so it's no wonder the rumours came out because he's literally so he started the rumours I have no idea why this took place <laughs> 13th published a video of himself alive he says he it was all a special plan to reveal Ukrainian agents I know that's what he says I just I don't know how it works well we do need someone to report all the negative ascents of Russian military ships and aircraft the proper award will find this warmonger and war criminal uh, don't quite what that means but but anyway he he was he wasn't dead and he was faking it so really don't know what was going on there so i do try and say that these are only rumors please take them with a pinch of salt when i do report something like that and i and i only reported that one because it was so widely um discussed uh, but for obvious reasons there were pictures of his dead body except he was faking it so yeah idiot or, or I don't know, or, or we had a clever clever reason to do that, but I just can't work it out. Right, in that same breaking news piece, I did the strike on the command centre because some people had linked it, but then it was eventually claimed that he was uh, killed by Ahmad, uh, and then not at all. But nonetheless, it's definitely the case that this ship in the Nipro estuary was hit, and uh, the claim is it was a command and control centre. Some people questioning how it will, how and why it would be a command and control center 
it is so as special curse on cat here says strike on the ship which is presumably used as a russian base or observation point the ship ended up there as a result of a dam destruction so Novokovka blew up and i think it got wedged uh floated down the river and got wedged in there and so they're, they're using it as command control or base or observation point or something so that is really quite close like seven kilometers away from the ukrainian side of the river and very close to to an awful lot of you know, military activity and and the ukrainian lines there uh, that's a satellite imagery of it now some people questioning that it re would it realistically have been used as such so there are satellite images that have come out of you know from the 3rd and 8th of march of this ship having visits from other boats um, so on the satellite images an object was occasionally seen near the ship and command post probably the, those are boats during the resupply missions to it russians deployed an observation post on the ship later the enemy deployed electronic warfare systems on the mentioned vessel the vessel was periodically used as a platform from which fpv drone strikes were conducted on the territory of the Kherson region so you can imagine this being a pretty good place to launch fpv drones from because you've got just flat water in front of you and things aren't going to get in the way of the communication from you as the operator to the um, to the drone. So you could probably get some really good range on the drones that you're firing, flying from there. So it, it does seem that it makes a lot of sense and the evidence does point towards it being you. And as well, the, the Ukrainians are not going to waste munitions blowing up stuff they just don't need to blow up. So it seems pretty probable to me that, that there was indeed a fairly high value target on there for the for the ukrainians to be using some fairly uh, substantial munitions to strike it now going back to that lost list we have that palantin electronic warfare system which is the newest russian electronic warfare system this is high value getting taken out actually by several gimlers i don't know if the first one's gimlers but that is certainly gimlers i think there might be an artillery strike that happened near it so it's over there and then a direct hit on it just afterwards although both could have been gimlers i'm not sure but that that first one wasn't an an airburst type tungsten uh, ball bearings flying out around like you see from some of the high mars uh, ordnance. So that that took place, and that's a high value bit of kit that the Russians have lost there. Uh, and then now, just this morning, there are uh, rumours that a Su twenty seven has been shot down in Belgorod. Uh, at this stage, it's an isolated report. Um, at the same time, Taganrog air defence is active, so we we'll come on to all of that in a second. But yeah, unconfirmed information, Su-27 just shot down uh, over the forest of uh, Valuki in Belgorod region, according to local residents. So there's a locals claiming that there's definitely an explosion that's happened there, uh, a pretty sizable explosion. Um, whether it is indeed a Su-27, I, I guess we might find out. But that's good news for the Ukrainians. Uh, one wonders whether it's a an example of friendly fire since it's ha happened within Belgorod. Or it could be the Ukrainians reaching into Russian territories again, like they have done in Bryansk with their Patriot back last year when they took down five airframes in one fell swoop. So that has happened. There's footage that has come out of the, I won't play it, but there's a screenshot of it uh, or paused frame. Um, footage of the Ukrainian MiG-29 multi-role fighter shot down on March 8th. And that's where the Major Andrei Tkachenko flew his MiG-29 on combat mission, probably shot down by an R-37M missile from Russian Su-35. So that's uh, interesting that, that, you know, that you are getting plane-on-plane uh, -plane shoot downs, um, air-to-air you know, losses there, which shows that the Russians have that superiority in, certainly over like the MiG-29, in terms of range of their own missiles against what the Ukrainians can do with their old Soviet-era gear. Um and that's so why they so desperately need F-16s and preferably F-16s that are, are of a decent upgrade that can allow them the radar range and missile range beyond visual. You know, you need, with these dogfights, it's not like 1980s Top Gun where you're, you're flying next to each other and you're doing these maneuvers and trying to shoot down the enemy. This happens out of sight. So you're firing at planes at the enemy that you can't see visually. So you can spot them on a radar, you get a lock on, you fire your missile, and then you get out of dodge. 
Um, and that, that appears to be what's happened there. Now, going back yet again to the strike on Taganrog on the repair facility for the A50Us, there are claims again, and this has come from Rob Lee, he's fairly decent on his reliability here, but Trentinanka, well, what's the original claim? Ukrainian officials, so actually Rob Lee's not, neither being accurate or inaccurate, he's just reporting what Ukrainian officials have told the Financial Times, that the attack by Ukraine at the weekend had critically damaged two Russian A-50 long-range radar detection planes at an aircraft r repair facility in the southern port city of Taganrog. And Trentilenko says, well, if it's true, the Russian Air Force is down to one A-50U orbit. So th there's only one plane that can do their uh, radar, you know, circuits, loops somewhere, you know, at any one time. So four to five of nine A-50Us at the start are done and the others are in operational, you know, canalized for spare parts or whatever. And you need three, more realistically, four A50U planes to maintain one um, AEW, so that would be sort of aerial electronic warfare coverage, I would have thought, on a 24-hour, seven days a week basis. In other words, if that's true, if the Ukrainians have damaged two more A50Us, which would be massively significant, but there's a really big if there, I have to admit there's a big if, if that is true, and with the other two losses of those planes that we've seen uh, previously, much more fundamental losses, then the the Russian radar capability, uh, the target acquisition capability, has been massively, massively hit. This this is huge. If that has happened, okay. And then going back to the claim that the Patriot was hit last week, I think this last week has been a really challenging week for the Ukrainians. I think the Russians have lost a lot of kit which is, yep, okay, they seem to be doing that on a weekly basis. So that's all fairly normal. And that, yep, they've lost some fairly high-value stuff too, um, especially if you're thinking Su-27 today and the Palantin uh, electronic warfare piece and so on and so forth. But the Ukrainians have lost some Nazans recently, some uh, Patriot, some S-300s. They've really been losing some high-value stuff. And, of course, some airframes themselves at MiG-29. So since many people still doubt it, I decided to post this, says War Vehicle Tracker. I can positively confirm the destruction of at least one M903 launcher for the Pac-2 Patriot. What you can see on the first picture is a post-morning, the loss of an M903 Patriot tail crew member. So this is the Erector launcher, um, and this is someone, you know, so... This is a useful bit of circumstantial evidence to suggest that this chap who's standing, you know, in front of one of these is no more. So that suggests that that he's that he's passed away. Uh, and then this shows clearly visible rotational part of the launcher, which confirms this as a M903 and not just a man cap one logistics vehicle. So some people are saying, yeah, okay. Originally, just to remind you, the claim was that. Uh, and this kind of end missile they're taking out. There's a bunch of vehicles going along this road or, or parked along this road. And then this kind of hit and took out two, two what's eventually claimed to be Patriot launchers. They were originally claimed to be S300s. And somebody pointed out that it can't be an S300 because it's loaded on, the, there's evidence there. And you can see this here. There was evidence of it being a German a chassis. And so an S300 isn't loaded on a German chassis, so it's much more likely to be a Patriot launcher. And then further to that, it's you can see rather than it just being a German like truck, uh, there are elements of the launcher that can be identified from the wreckage of what's left. Uh, second picture also confirms the vehicles being man cat ones. Um, and then so he goes on to say here, the first vehicle is a confirmed M903. However, the second vehicle could be as a vehicle on the far left in the second picture, only a MACCAM one containing air defense missiles for the launcher. So it might not be two launchers, there's a little bit of qualification here, and this would be super important. You know, you you much rather one launcher and a truck with some missiles than two launchers. Although the missiles themselves are fairly high value. So um, we will hope hopefully see better footage uh, to confirm the second M903 as well. But who knows at the moment, nonetheless, there's definitely elements, or it seems highly likely, that elements of a Patriot Pack 2 launcher 
um, or battery in general have been have been lost, and that, as mentioned previously, is is really high value kit, and that's a that's a huge loss to the Ukrainians. Right. So, but most of what I just said is referring to things that have happened over the last week. Uh, the the Su Su twenty seven being shot down is definitely um, from today, though. If it has happened. Now, talking about distant strikes, and this is where it gets into a lot of stuff taking place last night. Okay, so first of all, the Russians sent over 22 Shahid type drones, 17 of them shot down, sort of, oh, that's okay ish interception rate. Five still got through, don't know where they've gone. I don't know the detail details of that. They The Russians are also using glide bombs on, uh, well, here it appears residential building in Kharkiv. Uh, Russian aircraft targeted a city of Kupiansk overnight, uh, dropping a guided glide bomb on a residential area. That's always going to be what the Ukrainians claim, that they hit residential areas. We don't know whether the um, the military were using those residential facilities or whether it's just indiscriminate bombing or whether it's a bomb that didn't hit where it's designed to hit, which is very possible for these, these big old glide bombs that, that aren't always accurate. Although there are claims they are becoming more accurate. Okay, going on to what the Ukrainians have done to Russia overnight. And this goes back to the idea that they are just getting more and more... Uh, they have a greater and greater ability to hit Russia in a number of places in these overnight strikes. If you go back six months, Ukraine was sending off sort of one drone here, one drone there, flying them, and then it would just come down in Moscow or near St. Petersburg. And it flustered the Russians, but there weren't these huge um, explosions at, say, oil refineries that was causing them proper issues. It was more like, oh, look how far we can get our drones without them being shot down. And, and oh, you know, if, if, if we can hit the targets, then we can cause you some trouble. So, you know, this is a shot across your bow. Well, now we've gone from shot across the bow to shots ripping through the rigging and smashing into the hull, right? And and here we've got Belgorod a few hours ago. Uh, don't know what's been hit in Belgorod, but something fairly significant. But this is this these are your big hits. So oil reserves in or an oil depot in Oriol has been hit. Now that was that last night, and then this is it today. Uh, in the Russian city of Oriol, uh, at night there was an explosion at an oil depot. Strong fire broke out of the site, which has not yet been extinguished. So that is significant. Uh, but not just there. The, last night, drones attacked Stovo oil refinery in Russia's Nizhny Novgorod region, about 800 kilometers from Ukraine. I mean, this is significant. The attack caused a fire at the fuel facility there. Uh, and you can see that that is, you know, that is further north than Moscow. This is really significant um, damage being done to Russia's hydrocarbons infrastructure. Lukovsk Tovo oil refinery reportedly still on fire, according to Russian sources. That is another big one happening. And then today, Russian telegram channels are reporting a power plant is on fire in St. Petersburg. So that's the second city that you would expect to have some of the best air defenses in the world, arguably. Um, attack on 12 regions simultaneously demonstrates a weakness in Russian military planning and defense. Ukraine needs more weapons to finish the job. Well, actually, if there are 12 regions, I've, I've not heard that from anywhere else, but there are a number of places that have been struck overnight. And it's not so much about the Russian weakness as I think the Ukrainian strength, uh, you know, considering where they've come from. And it's no surprise, the, the challenge the Russians have is the sheer size of their country and that they have significant targets spread out all around the country for reasons of like, well, if we spread them out and put them f as far away from the rest of the world, then, you know, people can't, people can't easily hit them. But then if you can develop a munition that can get that far, then it means that, oh, now that things are so spread around, we need air defence capabilities really spread around as well like if everything was close together we could just ring around there you really concentrate our air defenses but now they're so spread out we need to spread out our air defenses and that means you can get around the air defenses by doing dog legs around places uh, and and so the fact that the targets are so spread out means that air defenses as mentioned need to be spread out but also if you're going to protect one facility you need them all around that so you need a number of air defense you know, pieces uh, pieces of equipment around that one facility rather than around all you know 
economies of scale, you've got 10 pieces of air, de air defense equipment that, that's protecting like six targets. Well, now you need 10 for that target, 10 for that target, 10 for that target. And Russia can't do that because they're also at war and having to get their air defense systems down to the front line. So we know they pulled air defense systems away from the Finnish border. So although they're going, oh, right, this is escalatory with NATO and our borders, they can't do anything about it because they're actually pulling stuff away from the border and put it, put, pushing it down to Ukraine. They did that previously with St. Petersburg. So what do we see in St. Petersburg? So they've taken S-400s from, from St. Petersburg, and now St. Petersburg, we have a power plant being here, and then just now we're hearing that large-scale fires reportedly occurred in the Ubukovo district, as well as near the Yuznaya power plant in St. Petersburg. Fires everywhere today, says, um, says Noel Reports. So just, you know, more from St. Petersburg. There's just a, a, a lot going on, and that's... Um, that's that's the second biggest city of you, uh, in Russia, and you'd expect should have really high level air defenses uh, operational there. So yeah, real real challenge for the for the Russians at the moment. Uh, meanwhile, ta in Taganrog, the Russian air defense is operating. Missile warnings are declared. Air alarms are, uh, are sounding. Firing at stuff, trying to hit Taganrog. Who knows what's going on there? And then we have um, in Berdyansk, just on the Azov Sea along the coast from Taganrog. Explosions rang out in Berdyansk near the airport there. Uh, so, so just there's a lot going on. And I think this is what we are going to see more and more from Ukraine as they're building these uh, these drones are clearly able to hit the targets, hit targets well within Russia. Uh, the only reason you're not seeing 100 of these every night is just because they can't make 100 yet. But as soon as they can make those numbers, you can rest assured those numbers are going to be thrown into into Russia. I, you know, I'm sure they're doing this. But if if I was the Ukrainians, I'd be like, right, our number one, one of our one of our top priorities. They have lots of priorities, mobilization, this and that. But one of them is surely going to be those Shahid type drones or long distance attack drones. We just need to make as many of those damn bits of kit as we can. Because rather than having, you know, one drone getting to hit a, an oil oil refinery, uh, you know, you can see that's on fire there. But now imagine that same facility, but 10 drones slamming into that, right? That's what Ukraine are going to want. This is not, let's not do 10% damage to that. Let's do like 80% damage to that if we can. Right, um, article in Forbes talking about uh, just other bits and pieces now that don't really fit anywhere. In Badici, Ukraine's Abrams tanks made their last stand and halted the Russian advance. So this is another David Axe article about how, uh, and we have seen four Abrams, I think, lost around Badici, but they are being used in, you know, right on a front line, used as they are, have been intended to be used, as they were designed to be used, you know, working against Russian Soviet tank, Soviet era tanks, uh, f driving against them and against other bits of kit, uh, and uh, being used effectively. Um, as yep, as it says here, it's a pyrrhic victory for the Russians. They captured Avdivka, but a massive cost. And these American tanks are doing a good job in uh, in defending that area at the moment. Um, so, but in making it stand in the town of Badici, five miles northwest of Avdivka, the 47th Brigade inflicted many, many more losses than it suffered. The roads towards Badici are littered with the hulks of Russian tanks, tracked fighting vehicles, and especially BTR-80 wheeled armoured personnel carriers, not to mention potentially hundreds of dead Russian infantry. More importantly, the 47th Brigade and the adjacent brigades to the south have halted the Russian uh, second and 41st combined arms army. In the heady two weeks following Avdivka's fall, the Russians rolled through from north to south the settlements of Stepova, Lastochkerna and Siverny, but only because the retreating Ukrainians chose not to defend those settlements as they headed for the settlements further west, Badici, Olivka and Tonyenka. Those settlements have water at their backs, making them harder to assault across and thus easier to defend. Um, anyway, uh, that's just an interesting little article there. Now, the other thing that's been going on, and this just today just seems a little bit crazy. There's so many strikes um, with with drones, but there are also strikes across the border with three Russian units attacking against the Russians. So these are pro-Ukrainian units, and one I hadn't heard of. So you got the the Freedom of Freedom of Russia Legion, Russian Volunteer Corps, and the Siberia uh, is is it Siberia unit. Um, 
we'll see uh, in a second. Anyway, um, so what's being reported? Big news this morning is that rebel Russian soldiers have attacked Russia from Ukraine. Three unofficial formations have coordinated their efforts to cross the border into Kursk and Belgorod regions. There's video from uh, the Legion of Free Russia, uh, not nighttime activities and stuff going on there. Uh, videos of tanks are appearing as well as shooting inside Russia's borders, such as here in Belgorod. I cannot verify these videos, but believe them to be genuine. And from this morning, um, while breaching Russia's border with some ease, it would appear the Siberia Legion has this had this message, quote, ballots and polling stations now are fiction. You can only change your life for the better with a weapon in your hands. Anyone against tyranny must make the right choice. Um, so, yeah. It's all, it's all happening at the border. Um, we have begun the spring liberation campaign. Get ready. It will soon become hot on the streets of many Russian cities, according to Freedom of Russia Legion. Quote, we know that the people of Russia are tired of Putin and his gang, which is pumping all the juice out of the country. And so there are several areas, as mentioned, Kursk and Belgorod, where the, that's fairly near to Kharkiv, where these re, these legions are operating. Um yeah, and this is from the Freedom of Russia Legion. Quote, we are coming to free you from abject poverty and fear, free from the dictatorship, the terrorist organization that seized power. Um, the Military Alliance of the Freedom of Russia Legion, the RBC, so that's the Russian Volunteer Corps, and the Siberian Battalion has started a spring liberation campaign, statement of the Freedom of Russia movement. So, yeah, all going on. And indeed, there's even like images of a, his video image of a tank uh, Bit, I presume this is from one of those three units over the border in Russia. And this is a Russian civilian filming that tank. The first videos of a tank in Russian border regions has emerged. Now, I was wondering how well mined these areas are, uh, you know, wondering as to whether that's that's easy or particularly risky. Uh, but anyway, in Shebekino, where in Belgorod, where we've seen these guys operate previously. This is one of the areas they attacked. If you remember, they moved on the Shebekino. It's all really big uh, sometime last year. Uh, it appears that they're, they're starting to do it again in the same place. So incredible. Now, the Russians have now released their claims that they've destroyed all the, you know, so when the Ukraine armed forces, Ukrainian armed forces attempted to penetrate into the Belgorod and Kursk regions, this is the direct quote, a uh, hundred people, no, so into Belgorod and Kursk regions, a hundred people, six tanks, uh, a Caesar self-propelled howitzer, and 20 enemy armoured vehicles were destroyed, the FSB reported. The FSB did not present photo or video evidence. So there are lots of claims that, that they've cr crushed all of these uh, units and destroyed them all. Uh, but there, there's as of yet absolutely no evidence that the Russians have done that. Right now, I almost reported this the other day. This is a this is what freedom looks like in Russia. Oh yeah, we love a bit of freedom. We do. So when a Russian student at the uh, state state university in Moscow, I think Moscow State University, sorry, uh, had a Wi-Fi network entitled Slava Ukraine, because you know those words are so dangerous to Russia, that student's now been arrested. Moscow court found him guilty of displaying symbols of extremist organizations on Thursday. Since the start of Russia's war in Ukraine, thousands have been handed prison terms or fines for criticizing the invasion or supporting Ukraine. This is what freedom looks like. According to Amnesty International, last year more than 21,000 people were targeted by Russia's repressive laws used to crack down on anti-war activists. A human rights group said deeply unfair trials were used to dish out prison sentences and hefty fines to silence critics in response to the slightest dissent. Because Russia is all about freedom and liber liberty and the liberation of Ukraine so that they can just crack down on freedoms like this. It's just absolutely ridiculous. Now this kind of annoys me. Disney cut the awarding of Ukraine's 20 days in Mariupol. So the, the awarding of the documentary of the Oscar and then the speech, that brilliant speech that he made afterwards uh, for best documentary at the uh, from the International Oscars broadcast. So the International Oscars broadcast did not run that segment. Ukraine's broadcaster, Suspilna, strongly criticised this decision and reminded them that in 2023, the same nomination in which a documentary about Russian political prisoner Alexei Navalny won was included in the shortened international television version, as was a political speech of his wife, Yulia Navalnaya, who accepted the award. 
So there seems to be double standards there. And this was a great opportunity f for Ukraine to be platformed. And Disney has decided not to do that, possibly in their international Oscars broadcast. Um, uh, and not, not the one, not the American one, but I, I just, it is annoying. Um, and then, uh, this has been doing the rounds. I, I could find you articles on this, but generally speaking, Ukraine has officially started negotiations with the U S and EU safety regulators on the restoration of air travel to and from Ukraine. Ukrainian officials also in talks with three companies that want to fly. Now, it may not be from Brospil Airport near Kiev. It might end up being Lviv or somewhere further to the west that's much safer. But they they they're going apparently to places like Israel to ask how they operate international aviation flights in and out of Israel under you know rocket potential rocket attacks and so on and so forth. Uh, so how how do they do it? How can Ukraine make it safe? I think it's important to start having these conversations. Um, it, it it would be great. To, for Ukraine's economy to be able to get get some kind of air traffic going to and from Ukraine. Uh, but yeah, that, that's that's ongoing at the moment. Uh, thank you for watching. Please like, subscribe and share. Really appreciate all your support. Such a wonderful community. A lot's going on today. That's why it's a little bit longer, although they all seem to be fairly long at the moment. There's just so much happening every single day. Take care. Speak soon.